occurred to me on the subway. <laughs> um, we will get around to talking about Di Dallas Buyers Club because that's what everyone wants to hear about. But I saw you last night on the Actors Studio series on Bravo. And Come on, <laughs> I got very curious about how you learn to do what you do, and if there are particular people along the way that you learn things from. Yeah. Um, in 1992, I went to the right bar, met the right guy. It was Don Phillips. He was in town casting a, a film. Uh, five hours later, we got kicked out of So Said Bar, and he said, have you ever done any acting before? And I said, I was in a Miller Lite commercial for like that long. <laughs> it didn't really count. It was like not even really a modeling job. It was just like, that, that was me right there. No one really did recognize me. But he said, I, you know, there's a, there was a film, the script I'm in town, casting, but there's a part you might be right for. Come to this address, pick, it, pick up the script tomorrow morning. I did 9.30. The character had um, three lines. It was in a few scenes. And I remember going back home to Longview, where I was from, and working on this character for two weeks. Came back to Redford and got it. The film and the role is David Wooderson in film Days Confused, which was my very first film. Now, when I went and read for that, um, it was obvious to Rick that I was not that guy. One, I was, when I was in a fraternity, I had my jeans pressed, I had tucked in, I shaved before going for this job interview, because that's what I was taught to do. <laughs> but, um, he, as soon as I, he said, okay, let's, let's read, I kind of kicked back and did my version of Wooderson. And he goes, I remember going, you, you, wait, you're not this guy. And I went, no, but I know who he is. And who the guy was for me at that time was who I thought my brother was when I was 10 and he was 17. So I had a very romanticized view. My brother was seven feet tall in my eyes. His car was the fastest car. His Concorde system was the best system, sound system in the world. And I remember seeing him leaning against the wall in the smoking section at school, and he was cooler than James Dean to me. So it was a, it was a romanticized view of who he was. But that's when I, I mean, that my first job and how I started to approach what I was doing, even though I don't know if I really knew what I was doing, was, okay, I'm, I may not be this guy, but if I, I know who this guy is, or I, I know someone like this, whether they're that way in real life or it's how I perceive them. Um, I, uh, I'll tell a quick funny story on the way to learning what I, what it is that I do and some, some pitfalls that I learned along the way. <laughs> Days to Confuse, I ended up working for three weeks. It was a lot of improvisation. The other actors never logging, lobbing me lines. And I remember having a feeling like, uh, boy, I feel like you could put a blindfold on me and I can be this guy, Wooderson. I feel like you could blindfold me, press the cord, and put me in any situation. I'll go to the 7 Eleven. I can buy. I remember going, what would, they, what would they buy with $5 at the 7 Eleven? Or what world did that character lives in? What would they know what they would buy, what they would wear, what they would do in any kind of situation? Um, well, after about uh, three weeks on that, which yeah, was a very, as I said, a lot of improvisation, I went on back to school, came back out to uh, Los Angeles and, and, and got a few roles. And it was around boys on the side. I had played a few very conservative roles, and I had about a year and a half where I would audition, and I had to get one callback, two callbacks, three callbacks, and I, and I never got the part. And I remember feeling like I'm too tight, you know what I mean? I, I think maybe I'm studying too much. I remember telling, talking to myself, maybe I'm studying too much about the import of the line and, and everything, and, 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 and you know what? I think I need to go back to doing what I did when I first started, which is I was just a guy, and I improvised. So I had, a, I had a film that I was cast for when I was playing this on the border Mexican drug lord. And I told myself, I said, I'm not going to look at the sides. I'm not even going to read the script. It's an on the border Mexican drug lord. I hear the synopsis. <laughs> I know my man. And I'll show up and just, obviously, I'll read it right before I go on. And if I know my man, that'll be like, well, that's exactly what he'd say. <laughs> I, go, I, go, I go to set that, that, that morning. All right, I'm just gonna. All I gotta do is have a glance at it. It'll be like, yep, yeah, I know, I know how to do it. Well, I look at it right before back to um, say action, and it was a page and a half monologue in Spanish. 
Oh. And I remember I felt this drip of sweat come over the back of my head. And, I, and I, for whatever reason, I looked over and I said, um, can, uh, can, can, can you give me that 12 minutes? Why well, I said 12 minutes, I don't know. I figured it was like not long enough to be considerate, but, but long enough to maybe get a little bit of this. Anyway, it was, I think I was horrible in it. I stammered through some Spanish and, 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 and tried to look at line. So then I was like, okay. That's not the way to go. <laughs> There's a blend here of having to do your due diligence, do your study, but then being able to go down the day and relax and throw it all away. In about 1997, uh, that same guy that I met, that cast me in Days and Fuse that I met in that bar, said, hey, you know what, I think it's time for you to start working with somebody. And I was sort of fearful of it. I said, when you're going to go learn something, and I never really learned what acting was, I was, you know... I'm also afraid of learning too much to be regimented. And I must say, when I first started learning, as this lady I worked with, Penny, in, uh, in Los Angeles, I was a little rigid. Penny Allen? Yes. Yes, I was a little rigid. Um, but then as what happens, you know, if you study, 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 you learn that it all becomes, you know, you, you don't take it everything literally. You learn what works for you, what doesn't, and uh, uh, went from there. So... I learned from her my rights as an actor. I learned from her that it, that it, that is, you know, I may start off going, "How am I this guy?" But I quick, I'm going to get to pretty soon. Wait, how is that guy me? Because it's got to go through through me when I'm going to if I'm going to portray the man. Um, I also, you know, one of the things that I've tried to do. And it's harder in some films than other, but some than others. But it's my favorite performance. It's my favorite kind of films. Is the impasse, you know, catch so many times when you. I've noticed when you've seen scenes. I've had many times where I tried to load the scene. I remember I had a movie. I won't say the name, but I saw it and I was like, "What is it? If there's something's off." And I was told by a friend, "Well, it's like you're trying to hit a grand slam every every scene." I was like, "Ah." Use a baseball term. Yeah. Sometimes you got to bounce. Sometimes you got to see. Sometimes you got to take a ball. Um, when it's wonderful, as y'all know, when it works, you go into a scene, you have 16 different ways to tell the truth. When you're stuck, sometimes you're just trying to protect from telling a lie. Not near as fun. Sometimes you're just like, man, I'm not feeling it. I just feel like I've got to connect the dots, and that's all I really can do. I don't have the song. I don't feel myself in flight. Now, when it's worked, and what I try to find now um, is from the inside out, Get the guy's monologue, and this is something that's kind of come to me and it really helped me in the last couple of years. Get the guy's monologue, then I can have the dialogue. Then I can do a scene if I got the monologue. If I know what what's the Socratic dialogue of the man that I'm playing, then have the dialogue. And it's not about the words, obviously. Um, and then I was able to just you know, when I'm do, I think when I do my job better, to be more in that moment, not anticipate. But also when I said impasse earlier, catch. I love it when you catch somebody in a scene. I, I love entrances and exits. I love doing all the work about, well, let's backload about where the guy's coming from and why, how he got here, and where is he going. I love to finish scenes. Anytime there's, you know, the old dot, dot, dot. Finish it out. Write it out. Expile. Just finish writing it. And I, I write a lot. I script write way more than, ever, than I ever actually say. But I have it. It loosens me up on the, out, on the entrance and the exit. And I like it when I'm seeing actors. I think I like my work best when I'm feeling like I'm being caught coming in and caught going out. And maybe if it's an entire, been the entire picture, if you feel like that two hours that you watched was not a just a, 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 a finite piece of a story, I like, I like watching films and characters. I go, I have watched the film and I can't. I love imagining what they were doing. The, five years before, and where they're going after that, the five years after, there's always a prequel and a sequel, and a, sequel and, 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 a, and a follow-up, even if, even if there's not in, in, in films. I like to at least have that understanding and feel, I let my imagination go, that I got a real good idea what this guy was doing the last five years and what they'll be doing for the next 50. Um, uh, you know, I mean, it, I've been, the last two years, I've really been able to, if I can, and this doesn't always happen, tap into the character's obsessions and then just get really feverishly drunk on them, on those obsessions. Because I'm always looking for something to take literally. And I've called them like a launch pad 
line. Sometimes you catch it in screen direction, sometimes it's written in a, in a character. A couple, David Wooderson, Days Confused. Rick Linklater writes a line that says, that's what I love about those high school girls, I get older, but they say the same age. Well, that's a line that you're like, well, who is this? Now, that, that guy's got a history. <laughs> that's not an attitude. That's really his constitution. <laughs> now the imagination goes wild and just, oh, you've got, um, you know, Dallas and Magic Mike, what had it was a launch pad character. I mean, there was stuff that was in there that, that they, it was written in that script. I was like, oh, well, the Barnum and Bailey was just easy. I just wrote, 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 wrote. And it was so fun to go improvise. Um, the Mark Hanna character in, in Wolf of Wall Street. I mean, Terrence Winter wrote a line. I'm sitting there showing the Jordan Belfort character, The Ropes, at a lunch. And it says, you know, the secret to this is hookers and cocaine. <laughs> and by the way, how many times we jack off? I mean, that's, you're going, oh, well, there's no ceiling on, on this guy. <laughs> so, be a rapper, be a poet, go. <laughs> now, obviously, if you're playing a lawyer or you're playing a, um, a scientist, someone whose vernac occupational vernacular is, has to be precise and to the moment, it's not as easy to just riff and rap. Um, but um, I, I always try to find something that the character says, I go, I think, what if they take that literally? And then, you know, when you read something that you go, that's a real, real personal politic of that character. It blankets an entire performance. And it also gives me something, I think, something to fly with that I can always have in my pocket if I get in trouble in a scene. I go, well, I know that this man is about this. I know he needs this throughout. Before this story ever started and after this story goes away, I know he needs this. So if I follow that, at least, I know I can't go wrong. Um, one of some things that I've... I remember telling, write, writing this down to myself. Don't act like one, be one. Mm -hmm. And that's, a pretty, that's always a pretty mm -hmm. good one, a pretty mm -hmm. simple one. Um, you know, it's sometimes easier than others. I remember you, you were originally going to be a lawyer. Yeah. And you played a lot of lawyers. Yeah. Um, and your breakout role, Time to Kill, was a lawyer. And in a way, that part was really hard. I mean, it seemed to me extraordinary that you were this person who'd never held a film together before, and you were playing with these extraordinarily technically competent Sam Jackson and Kevin Spacey and Sandra Bullock and, you know, I don't. I couldn't figure out how you had the nerve to take over the screen when they were on it. Just take your time and right. take the space, right. and that was extraordinary. Well, I had a couple of. I mean, one for one thing, that was my first role where I was the lead. It was, uh, um, you know, I was aware people were talking about this is a major, big budget studio film. This is on your shoulders. But, but I remember uh, Joel Schumacher, the director at that time, he said this too, it was a great thing to say to a young, young actor. He was very early on when I would go to talk about character work, he'd go, no, hey, you're Jake. He remembers from a week before, he's like, no, stop, you're Jake. You are Jake. And so I still you know, went off and had my musings about where I was the character, where he was me, but he's kept going, no, you're Jake. It's that simple. That was his direction almost the entire time. It was a great thing to tell me at that time. It took pressure off. Um, and I think the other thing was, you know, when you work with people that are, that are good, what, we always find out that there's, we think there's going to be a, they have a magic trick, but they really don't have a magic trick. But usually the people that are good at what they do, they just usually do the simple stuff really good. And they're easier to work with. And I've found, I found that. I mean, when I give you a long list of people that that's, that that's that way, they seem to be easier to work with, so um, those, are, those are two things that I know are true about that experience. Well, right now you've been on a real role where directors want you for very specific parts that are character parts now. Yeah. Um, Magic Mike is a character part, the little part in the score says a movie would just scared me to death and made me put all my money back in the bank for no interest at all because I really a wonderful guy. And he really scared me. And, um, and Dallas Flies Club, especially, I mean, it's tremendous character work. I think maybe we should take a look at a clip 
from Dallas Buyers Club. So let's see if these guys can load this clip up and take it now. <laughs> can you tell us what made you want to play this part? Yeah, um, it came across my desk about six years ago. Um, I immediately wanted to do it. I didn't know about Ron Luther, but I didn't know about Dallas, about Buyers Clubs. And I remember, I remember thinking that, uh, one, I was like, boy, this, this, is a, this is an incredible story about, it, about this man, about this man's life uh, that I knew nothing about. And I remember saying, boy, even if this was fiction, this would be worth telling. And then the fact that it was not fiction, that it was based on his life, and it true, and made it more important. Uh, and, and it gave me a lot more incentive to have to do it. Um, I love the original sort of anarchic way that it dealt with a very dramatic and heartfelt subject, HIV, and uh, not only in 86, but with this guy's life and a lot of others. Um, when he was heterosexual, I thought that was interesting from, the, from a heterosexual point of view. Two, he was a son of a bitch the whole way through. He was a self-serving, self-preserving, businessman, hustling son of a bitch. And I thought, and I was real happy that it never got sentimental. Mm -hmm. And I felt, and I felt like, boy, what a challenge this could be to pull off the truth and the heart, but also the blasphemous humor, because it was a real guy on the page. Um, so I thought that was an original way to deal with this subject matter. And I remember early on saying, you know what? If this does, if this was, if this had been a larger budget film. This had been a Hollywood studio film. They would have rewrote Act Three, and Ron Woodruff would have, at the Act Three turn, two to three, mm -hmm. would have had to come and tell everyone, "I'm sorry for my bigoted, homophobic ways. I hope you know what have I become. I'm sorry." You, the bow would have come out, mm -hmm. right. and the version of the bourgeois blues would have started to play <laughs> <laughs> for this guy's life because he was not that guy. He was just was not that guy. And I remember. Say, so, you know what, if, we, if, we, if, we, if you keep him the son of a bitch, the, the humanity will reveal itself. If, if you keep him the businessman, the crusader will reveal itself. And we didn't know. I mean, there were many times, um, not during shooting, because not many people talked to me, and I didn't talk to many people then, but there were many times I heard, and I'm sure it's why I was passed off for 20 years, but this, this guy's not sympathetic. And I remember, I'm glad I felt this way, but I, my immediate response was, that's not my job to make him sit that. Empathetic. He's a real guy. You can understand that, hey, that's, that's, a, that's, a, real, that's a real guy. He's not playing an attitude. That's who he is. And if you don't like who he is and his politics from, when, you, when you first meet him, you go like, I know people like that. You go, man, they don't even know better. You know, there is ignorance at that, at that time. And there's a lot of people still that way. So I just saw him as a real human. And I remember saying, you know what, McConaughey, just hang your hat on the humanity of this guy. Not the morality, but the, the reality and the humanity of this guy and stick to it. And trust that that humanity will come out. And uh, so, you know, I, I don't have the best relation with sentimentality. Um, and sometimes I like it in this kind of place, but other times I think it's, it's force fed a little bit for my taste. Um, so it was a way to deal with, with the, a really dramatic and heartfelt subject matter with a really original anarchic guy. And, you know, we knew this thing, you know, you, you just, you know, the post you get one liner, you know you got, you got something that's of import, something that is probably going to be good medicine for you to go see. But what you don't know, but I think we did pull off, which was sort of a coup, is that how entertaining it is. Um, and how, and in my experience of watching it with people, the first act, because people know the subject matter, they're a little afraid to laugh. <laughs> so you're like, I can't laugh in this movie right now. <laughs> <laughs> and then people start to lose something, you go, I can laugh. And you, it's, such a, it's a really good example of how humor reveals such humanity. That humor shows such sincerity. And almost, almost, I mean, there's so many scenes in this that could have been heavily dramatic and could have been just as true. I mean, Ron. You know, comes home after the dinner with Eve Sachs. How many people have seen it? He comes home to dinner with Eve Sachs, and he, and he, and he comes home and he, and he masturbates. And that could have been tears rolling down face, I can't have sex with anyone. But yet, 
looking at the pictures of hot rod women and then he sees the Mark Bolin pictures. <laughs> the scene where um, he says, who's the lady in the clinic? She has AIDS and then they go to the bathroom and hook up. Yeah. That, we, that was a very touchy scene. That came up because when we were listening to t um, tapes, and I was listening to tapes of Ron Wood, there was always a woman in the background. And the way he talked to her, you could tell they were hooking up. And, and I went to John Mark, I was like, look, he had HIV, but it, it, he was still having sex. And we were like, oh, oh I don't know how to do that. In the movie. That's like really touchy. Two people with HIV, I don't know how we do that. Well, one day we show up to work and John Mark goes, goes to we'll walk in there, call the secretary over and ask who it is. And then I think I'll go back in the bathroom. And so we, we shot it. Well, if you look at the scene, it's not icky at all. It's almost... One, it's a little bit life-affirming, it's sad, but it, it cuts outside to the staff listening <laughs> to the sound, and, it, and it's one of the funniest scenes in the movie. Um, so again, he, he, the director, did a lot of things with how he dealt with scenes that could have been very heavy-handed, but yet the humor showed the humanity in them. And that, that, was, that was a lot of Jean-Marc. Okay, why don't we take a look at another clip from Dallas Pius Club, actually? something you were talking about. Uh, I think we have to open it up to these guys out here. Uh, wait till you get a mic. There are two people with mics on either side. This before this was a this I've said this before this is my responsibility as an actor to do this was not an eccentric affected choice of oh I think it'd be cool if I did um, it was something I, I needed to do and uh, yeah the right the right role it was definitely part of the wonderful adventure that I had um, in the middle here again lots of hands hi um. You talked about, well, how do you get into the headspace of someone in, in a true story and in really heavy subject matter, and then be able to go home and let that be and, okay. and wrap at the end of the day? It seems very, very difficult. Um, you know, I, I mean, this being somewhat biographical, I had so much to digest. I mean, I had 16 hours of tapes, transcripts. I had his family open their scrapbooks to me. I had his diary. I had so much plenty to do. Those things that us actors go, wow, look at all this. And I'm going to dive into this. And I'm going to have so much fun creating backstories, things that I was getting from his diary. And then you start reading between the lines. You know, I mean, I remember you could, I could hear what he said on his tapes. And after the first couple of times, I listened to what he was literally saying. And then I had to remember, this was a guy talking to a guy who was going to write his story. Now, we, so he was already soliciting, whether he knew it or not. And he was a salesman. But you go, okay, what are the things in between? You know, and I remember hearing certain speech patterns sneak up, where he'd be sound like a complete, this guy a seventh grade education who became this expert. And... Uh, he would speak like a medical scientist and expert, and then slip off the same sentence into a conspiracy theory, come back, tell a joke, and forget what the fuck he was talking about, and the dementia was coming in. And so he, it was all right angles. This was not merged and, 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 and easy. There, there were rough corners with, with this guy. All of them were rough. Um, his diary up to this book gave me the monologue. That was my secret. I had that in my hip pocket. And that, there's a lot to read between the lines. I mean, uh, everything from what his dreams and aspirations were, wandering, wandering, trying to just maybe get out of there, figure out what he could do with his life. Uh, and that would fade out every week till Thursday, Friday, Saturday. The, the, the long hand would get a little more. He'd tell he was high up late at night, scribbling, doodling, you know, um, talked about people he hooked up with and 
the guy that lived in a small town trying to get out. This was before he had HIV. Um, so I just, I had, I had all that. There were certain places I went where, you know, imagination served. I would try to give four or five versions of each scene because I knew we weren't going to have time on the day to talk about them. I knew we weren't going to have time to say, well, hey, what if we tried this? Just went in and tried to go as loaded as possible. Um, and have enough to where I felt like I could go run, keep running the camera, don't even need, don't even need your cut. Um, but the coming home, I mean, I don't, I didn't come home, I don't think I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm an actor who, I don't know, that, that word method, I don't, it's kind of misused, it's got so many definitions, people throw it around in an odd way. I mean, when I, I so I was, a, I was, I say I was, so seeing this guy from the inside out that I was never objective or never a voyeur on what was happening. But at the same time, I know I was talking to Jean Marc about the scenes continually. Now I was talking to him, in my understanding of the scene, but I was talking to him as Ron Woodruff would talk to him. Now that number one was relaxing because Ron gets to the point real quick. <laughs> <laughs> he doesn't miss yeah. words. And so our communication was hardcore and it had nothing to do with, you know, one of manners and graces. Um, which at least made it, our, our communication clear. But coming home, um, yeah, no, well, with kids, that's a, that's a, I mean, that's sort of, sort of a, a free, wonderful kick in the heart. They just remind you, hey, you're playing make believe, so make them believe. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, you're coming home, and I'm a big like, logic guy, and. Kids quickly remind you, logic doesn't have anything to do with this. <laughs> There's not a period on the end of any of these stories. Mm -hmm. You said the end? No, I said the cheetah grew wings and flew over the Purple Sea and landed on top of the elephant. If you say you can't do that, well, I'm saying the cheetah ran west and ran around the world until it came up on the other side with the elephant. You're like, that could happen. <laughs> so, there's a certain relaxation to that, and it's a nice, for me, it's a nice reset at the end of the day. Um, I mean, I know I definitely change somewhat in my own character with each role I'm playing you know, in, my, in my own life, but, uh, you know, I don't come. It's, it's, a nice, it's, it's nice to have. I like having that one checkout at the end of the day. I don't like in the middle of the day, an hour between setups, go back to the trip. I do not like that. I don't like going back and introducing myself to the real world, hearing a phone ring, hey, can you make this phone call in between? I don't like that. On the day, I like go to work in the morning. Twelve hours later, let someone tell you, "Okay, it's a wrap," and then kind of have a glass of wine, fade out, and head back home and see the family. But yeah. Okay, let's have a mic down here. Two people actually right next. To three people next. To you. Okay, so just pass it down. Um, Matthew, I, I just wanted to, to acknowledge to you that this is the most authentic portrait of a person with AIDS that I've seen in the film. I know that world really well. I know PWAs that I loved that were assholes. I know PWAs that were straight, that were assholes, but I love them because of their humanity. So I want to congratulate you and the, and the script. I mean, I thought the integrity of the script was just wonderful. My question has to do with working with Lee Daniels and working with John Pierre. The kind of courage that you brought to each of those characters in The Paperboy and in this film where do you go to go, oh, I'm going to push myself there in a very dangerous zone for someone who may not be like the character? Well, when I said get drunk on their obsessions earlier, yeah. look, I think one of the things, you know, like there's a scene in Lee Daniels Paperboy where Ward gets beat, you come and see him bloody and beat with the two black guys. Well... You know, I, it was, Ward was a guy with all about secrets, right? So I was, figured he was really into those S&M clubs down in Miami. And that's the place he went because he could get away with it mm -hmm. and not be exposed. And so this night in that film, he goes back down that dark road. And I remember the idea was, Lee was like, okay, so I think you'd be, you know, laying there and you're, and you're, and you're uh, you know, you're, you're probably handcuffed in front. And you're laying there bloody. And I was like, no. Hands are handcuffed to the ankles, and it's been bent over like he's took it the worst way, and it was ugly. Mm -hmm. And he, 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 
thing about this guy, he liked he liked it. Mm -hmm. He needed that pain. Mm -hmm. He needed that pain. And I remember Lee going, "You are not. You are not." Like, oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then we were like, so. You know, that was in context with who the guy was. I'm not ever trying to push something for eccentricity's sake. Mm -hmm. I've done that before, and I've seen it done before, and you're like, well, that was eccentricity for eccentricity's sake. To what? Get shock value? Now, mind you, I know that that character in that role, and me even playing that character in that role, had something to do with the shock value mm -hmm. of the whole story, mm -hmm. and the fact that it was me playing it. There's a certain, for some people, a certain shock value. But, I mean, it didn't feel like something that I was like, this is a really creative thing. It seemed like that's the truth of what the guy would do. And if I'm, while I'm there on the set, working, I'm not thinking about my outside world perceptions of me, Matthew, McConaughey. I, that, that's one of the fun, great things about this travel we get to do when we go act. You get to go there and be in that bubble and say, just be true to your man here, tell the truth on this guy. And that's, that's, and so, I just, you know, I don't know, I, I mean, we, I always like if I can in context find what certain characters are obsessed with and what their monologue or secrets are, I I enjoy pushing them further to the truth. Because I think that the truth burns. <laughs> truth the truth is ugly. Mm -hmm. It ain't easy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, and that was a that was a character and and then with this one, you know, shoot this guy, he wouldn't have been such a son of a bitch, he wouldn't have lived the seven years. Mm -hmm. That same guy that you can't stand. It's the reason he stayed alive seven more years. Mm -hmm. And rage, that's what this guy had so much of. And I've said this before, but it's true, man. No emotion. Rage gets more shit done than any other emotion. Like it or not, for good or for bad, rage gets more done. Causes more movement. And that's what this guy had. That's what kept him alive, because he was so damn mad. You know? Okay. Yeah. Hey. When, uh... When there's a scene in the movie when Ron was crying in the car, yeah, and um, I saw sadness in that cry, but I also saw like hope or happiness. I'm not sure, like an uplifted, uplifting emotion. Mm. And was there an uplifting emotion in that cry? And if there was, um, like, how do you manage all those emotions at once? Yeah, look for me with. Most emotional scenes like that, like I'll, I'll, I'll personally cry at birth much quicker than I'll cry at death. I just personally will. I, if I think of something, the guy that was wrongly accused that got out of prison, I'm, I'm weeping. You know, he, he got out. I mean, kid's birth, things like that. That's where I, I lose it. Um, that scene, though, for me was, I didn't see anything in that to see as hopeful. That's Ron at his peak of isolation. He's just gone through, just been told he has it completely. What are you talking about? You're speaking another language. HIV, what? What the fuck did you say? Takes the guy as a challenge to the doctor, which was great. That guy that would do that. I remember thinking, that's how that guy would react. He wants to fight the guy that said, those are fighting words. <laughs> <laughs> the doctor said, you got HIV. <laughs> and then, denial, and then he figures it out on his own. And so that was, for me, that was just that, that drive was Ron's trip, and all of a sudden it hits him. That's when it first hits him. That his mortality is for real. He's been given 30 days. And what the fuck am I going to do? He looks at the gun. You know, he's got enough rage to not pick that thing up. But he's had a, it, 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 was, it was a dead, it's where the reality set in for the first time. And that's it. So I didn't personally have anything in my mind or play anything that felt hopeful um, in that scene. No, you, you spoke about finding your characters within yourself or within your, the truth of who the character is. Yeah. Do you ever find the need to go and speak to other people to find the sorts? I mean, you said because sure. this is a biography. And can you talk about what you look for in the people you interact with, sure. whether it's a lawyer or whether it's an HIV sure. uh, positive? Um, I've done a couple of biographical pieces. So like I said, when I went to talk to Ron's family, sister and daughter, and I, when, I, when I heard those tapes, and I knew here's a guy selling his buyer's club to a guy who's going to make a movie, you've got to go, where's he telling the truth, and where do I need to read between the lines about who he really was? Because I'm playing, and it's live, he's, he's just coming into this, he's, he's not, he doesn't have the buyer's club yet in this film. Um, secondly, I went and went to meet his family. You would talk about somebody in your, in your family that's, that's, that's 
no longer here, it's real easy to give somebody the greatest hits version of who that person was at his best. The things they say at the funeral. His family was so honest about who he was and who he was not. You know, I'm like, he stole my cars twice. <laughs> Never got them back. One of them they just found in New Jersey. <laughs> and then he goes, well, he was a son of a bitch. And they'd always think, but you couldn't help but love him. Um, and then, you know, I've done others where I really tried to, I really tried to study the person and emulate them. I've also done them like in Bernie where I didn't want to. My imagination seemed so clear with who the guy was and Rick Linklater, the director, knew him. So I said, I need to go through, I need, you're, you're my meter because I'm not going to go, I'm choosing not to go study this guy because where my imagination is with what you've written on the page, I just don't feel like I want or need anymore. So I said, you tell me if I'm going too much or not enough. And you know, Rick and I work where he always takes me right up to, if it's comedy, he'll take me right up to well, before we get to caricature, you know? <laughs> but he's got a great, he and I have a real similar sensibility about that. Um, so I trusted Rick um, on, on that. Um, look, there are other people. There are, you know, people that, that, that I've talked about that I have, and I'm not going to say their names because I haven't made the movies, but, but their stories are still out there to be made. And I, what you hear, how them talk about themselves on Friday night, <laughs> it's great. Talk to them Sunday night. <laughs> I never spoke like that. I, no, I would never use those words. I never did those things. And you're like, oh, okay, Sunday came. Which church? <laughs> Thinking about post-mortem. <laughs> you know, how am I going to look? How, what, what shadow am I leaving? Talk to them next Thursday night. I was wilder than this. I was, I did this and then. So you have to, I have to read between the lines. And usually I think the Friday night verse is more true. Who they are. Um, so they'll listen to things. I try to listen to things like that. That's what I mean when I say read between the lines a little bit. Um, and a lot of times what they're saying when they're not talking. Or when you catch them when they don't feel like they, on that, they don't feel like it's a proverbial Sunday night and they need to give the best version of themselves. So someone, yeah, two people way in the back, if we can get mics in the middle, actually there are three people, and I think that's going to have to be it. Way back in the back row. You can probably yell, but I wouldn't hear you. you know? <laughs> Yes, here, yes. Yeah. Uh, so I want to ask you something, and it's um, in the beginning of your career, how do you deal with um, example, economical struggles or with validating yourself, especially in this film industry, like um, validating yourself as you are going to make it, you know? like. No matter what, especially like I'm talking about like 20 years ago, uh, like validating yourself as you were going to make it, like how do you deal with all of those struggles uh, that make some people never make it, even if they're super talented, mm -hmm. or, but others like you, that you make it. And when I say you make it, you know, it's because of this big recognition, but because you're able to do what you do, right. and what you like to do. Um. Well, let me tell you what, what happened for me, and everyone's got a different script about how it worked out for them. I did Days of Confused between my junior and senior year of college. I finished that for the first time. I was like able, a week into that was when I first said, man, I, I love this. I'm getting paid $320 a day. People are patting me on the back of the day saying, you're good at this. That's the first time I ever thought about it as a possible career. I knew I wanted to be in the storytelling business, but I wasn't even allowing myself to dream about being an actor. I go back to school, graduate, and drove out west, and I, and I had a, uh, what I thought was a production assistant job. Now, I show up out there with a few thousand dollars in my pocket, and that production assistant job got pushed. The movie got pushed, so I didn't have that job. But the first audition I went on was for a guy named Hank McCann for a film called Boys on the Side. 
So while after that audition, the next one, Angels in the Alpha, this is places where I got very fortunate, lucky, however you want to call it. Angels in the Outfield was a Disney baseball film. <laughs> they wanted to see me, all American guy named Ben Williams who played the outfield. I put on my all American cap, went to go see this guy on the Warner Brothers line. I remember I walked in, it was the afternoon, I was backlit by the sun on the Warner Brothers line, the guy was on the couch. And I walked in, and he goes, Hey, look at you, the all American kid. I said, Yes, sir. He goes, You ever played baseball? I said, 12 years. He goes, You got the job. <laughs> All of a sudden, I'm in Oakland playing baseball for 11 weeks. I scheduled to left 48 5. We threw a big party, and I paid. Uh, and then that Hank McCann thing, I could call back to Reaper Herb Ross and got that part from Rose on the side. So, the first auditions I had out there.